Welcome to what's actually going to be the last official episode of Real Geeks for 2020. I'm sure many of you are disappointed that I just said in 2020. (laughs) As for our holiday episode, as would make complete and total sense, we'll be taking a look at the 1987 Brian De Palma film, The Untouchables. Because nothing says holidays like Prohibition era mobster Chicago. I grew up in a tough neighborhood. Sometimes a reputation follows you. Robert De Niro is Al Capone. There is violence in Chicago, of course, but not by me and not by anybody I employ. And I'll tell you why, because it's not good business. Kevin Costner is Elliot Ness. I have sworn to put this man away with any and all legal means at my disposal, and I will do so. Sean Connery is Jimmy Malone. You want to get Capone? Here's how you get him. He pulls a knife, you pull a gun. He sends one of yours to the hospital, you send one of his to the morgue. That's the Chicago way. You just joined the Treasury Department, son. Everybody knows where the booze is. The problem isn't finding it. Let's do some good! The problem is who wants to cross the pond. Somebody messes with me, I'm gonna mess with him. You carry a badge? Yes. Carry a gun. Get your hands in the air! You're all under arrest. You fellas are untouchable. Is that the thing no one can get to you? Hey, everybody can be gotten to. All right, then. Drive him to the station. Anything happens, you shoot first. You understand me? Well, I'll tell you one more thing. You got an all-out price fight, you wait till the fight's over, one guy's left standing, and that's how you know who won. Just tell me, are you being careful? Careful as mice. I want to hurt the man Malone. I want to start taking the battle to him. I want to hurt Capone. This man can finger Al Capone. This man can put Capone behind bars. Well, what's the matter? Can't you talk with a gun in your mouth? You're not to prove your methods. Yeah? Well, you're not from Chicago. I want you to find this Nancy boy, Elliot Ness. I want him dead. I want his family dead. Paramount Pictures presents a Brian De Palma film. I have forsworn myself. I have broken every law I swore to defend. I have become what I beheld, and I am content that I have done right. You got nothing, nothing. And if you were a man, you would have done it now. Never stop fighting till the fight is done. The Untouchables. (laughs) Now, um... I had actually, I think, first seen The Untouchables uh, when, I think shortly after its original theatrical run. So I was watching this w- when I was 10, and I still don't quite understand. Oh, that explains understand. a lot. <laughs> that explains a lot. Yeah, I was just going to say, I don't understand why my parents let me do it. I'm fairly certain I saw this when I was probably six or seven. It would have just been on like ASN or something. So yeah. completely edited for content, uh, sitting there watching it with your parents. But at the same time, uh, I my memory of it is jumbled up with the uh, the resulting 1993 two season television show. That is, uh, of course, also called The Untouchables. 
that is the remake of the show that this movie is actually adapted yeah. that came about because of the success of this movie. And Wait, uh, the movie had success? It oh, did. yeah. Oh, it yeah. Incredible success. Well, and I, one, one thing you got to remember is as much as Capone, in terms of the criminal underworld, is basically an immortal and will be from now till the end of time, mm. in the 80s... <laughs> yeah, 1920 uh, Chicago was this big, massive thing in the 80s, and very specifically Al Capone. Yeah. Well, Rivera, of course, wasted his entire reputation <laughs> hunting a vault that didn't fucking exist. Cut to. You know, uh, when we began opening this vault nearly two hours ago, we had no real idea what we'd find inside. As it turns out, we haven't found very much, at least not, uh, not yet. Uh, and so, for really, the record, this was the first time that I had watched the movie. Oh, we're going to your thoughts first. <laughs> How is that even possible? I mean, you like, don't want to go to my thoughts first. <laughs> you really don't. You really don't. One of the messages that I sent the group chat was "blink, blink, <laughs> grabs booze." <laughs> There's a reason I felt the need to self-medicate watching this movie. Mm-hmm. Which is interesting because uh, for me, I think uh, getting ready for this show was probably, I think the first time I had gone back to watch this thing uh, since I, basically since I started thinking more critically about films in general. And so uh, the first time I watched it was uh, Thursday night up in the theater at Bears Lake. Had the theater completely to myself. Did you say that they they viewed it? They they really sit in black and white in the theater. Uh, no, not in the theater. I wish they did. Oh, okay. Um, as but uh, that was that as I mentioned uh, when we reviewed the shadow. Uh, sometimes when I watch it at home here, I'll usually turn off the color on my TV and watch <gasps> that in black and white. And I got curious with the Untouchables. I was like, I kind of want to see what this looks like in black and white. Well, the funny thing is, initially, the cinematographer wanted to shoot it in black and white, and therefore yeah. it is actually based around the principle of at any time you could turn it black and white. That's why there's no, uh, uh, there's no really sharp colors. There's no hard edges on anything. It's all supposed to be just nice TV broadcast black and white, very specific. You mean mundane? Mundane it, very mundane, yes, but also it. They, for for the early uh, couple of years of this project, it was very close uh, to the television show in the sense that they wanted it to feel like a nineteen fifties television show. The Untouchables, a Desilu production. But it. It did veer away from that, and the main reason for that is that uh, De Palma, Mamet, uh, Art Linson, a bit, but like basically everybody behind the camera, none of them were fans of the show that the studio wanted them to adapt. So they were uh, very much like, no, we're just going to take this and we're going to do our own thing with it. And frankly, I'm kind of glad that they did because like the actual story of Ness and Capone is incredibly boring. It's not exciting at all. No. Everything that was exciting about this? No. No. <laughs> yeah, no, it's um and I think before we go into that, obviously a uh, quick run through of the cast because we have uh Kevin Costner Oh, let's be honest. It's Kevin Costner playing Captain America, playing Elliot Ness. Yeah, but it's his first time playing uh, Captain America, playing another role. Yeah. This is where he began the naive, uh, uh, just trying to do good kind of uh, uh, character that he carried through everything. And then eventually became really tired. Yeah, it's, it's like there's... <laughs> 
in terms of Costner's work, in, like, in a lot of ways, he's the weakest actor in this movie. Somebody had to say it. Oh, no, oh, no, like, that's kind of an accepted fact at this point. Yeah, Kevin Costner exists in films for things to occur to him and yeah. for him to eventually get frustrated. That is his entire purpose. He will never do the wrong thing, uh, with the exception of, of course, throwing Frank Nitty off the fucking uh, court. <laughs> it's totally fine. It's totally fine. Uh, but like, he'll he'll always be like tempted, and then choose the right. Yeah, he's he, he's 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 Wheaties Captain America, and by Wheaties, I'm very specifically choosing the bland one. Yeah, without the sugar. The blandest Captain America. I don't want to be ignorant about history, but was there really an Elliot Ness? Yeah, I. But I. But I. I understand the question because for a long time, I, he's an icon. I mean, he's, he's he is kind of a cartoon figure. And somebody once told me, he says, you know, there really was an Elliot Ness, and I was surprised. This was about eight, nine years ago, but I was not aware of it at that point. I always thought of him as like this is a fable, and it's not. Hmm, that's interesting. Next up, we have uh, Robert De Niro as good old Al Capone who, oh, De Niro is just sinking his teeth into this role. De Niro's sinking his teeth into this role, and I swear to God, uh, there is no role. It's a caricature. Yeah. And he has a scene and appears in a few others. That's it. Man gets, yeah. like, top billing, and he, he has one scene where he shines, and the rest is it, him just being like, baseball. <laughs> uh, they toned that scene down for some fucking reason. That actually occurred. Yep. But he did it to two other guys as well. Yep. Uh, that and then in... shot them in the head, apparently. Yep. Yes, yeah. Well, you got, you, you got to make sure. Got to oh, make sure yeah. that they're dead. The bat may not have worked. It, yeah, it, and what what had actually happened was that uh, two of Capone's top hitmen had uh, put together a plan to take out Capone and take over the family. Capone, of course, gets wind of this and organizes the dinner, makes ma makes the big speech, and then kills them in front of his entire organization. I mean, we're Which, still talking like, about it. Yeah, message received. <laughs> Oh, Jesus Christ. Uh, and then in terms of the main cast, we finally, of course, come to... The most quotable man in this entire movie, Sir Sean Connery, is Jimmy Malone. Who, it's, it's like, it looks like he clearly came to work, but you also can't help but think, this is the most natural performance Sean Connery ever gave, because... I don't know if he's even acting for half of it. No, he is not acting. Well, he is reading let's see. Life. He points out that George Stone. Uh, so what's your name? George Stone. No, no. Yeah. What's your name? What was your name before you changed it? Because, you know, where are you from? Well, you know, the, no, no. Where are you from? Who are you? And yeah. Okay. So this is a guy who Sean, you know, Sean Connery's character points out is a WAP which the etymology is uh, a, a derogatory term for guapo, Italian person. Yeah. Uh, so they make a whole point that George Stone was Italian born or is Italian descendant uh, and changed his name to reinvent himself to fit in as an American. And then when this scene is going on, George Stone makes the whole point of, you know, blah, 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 Irishman. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think that was an Irish accent that Connery was doing. Oh, no, that was no. his Irish accent. Oh, no, that's, that's an Irish accent really for Connery. Connery. That's, that's Connery's Irish accent. 
That's his Russian accent. That's his Spanish accent. Mm-hmm. Greetings. I am Juan Sanchez Villalobos Ramirez, chief metallurgist to King Charles V of Spain. Bond. James Bond. A game of chess against our old adversary, the American Navy. That's the Chicago way. And no one cares. But and again, I did not reach for the booze until halfway through the fucking movie. <laughs> hey, Vita, you want to know something that will have you down that entire bottle right now? I've only got this much left of the bottle, so... um. Keep it in hand. I'm going to tell you, Mike, hold on to your pants. <laughs> Sean Connery won an Oscar for that performance. Yep. Oh, come on. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, and a few enemies. Uh... But no, like, like, like Malone is easily the most parodied and the most quoted character in like all of cinema. But here's the thing. Um, that, That's just so his, wrong. His performance of the character so changed everything that had been known about like how he was presented. Cause uh, Malone existed in, uh, he was based on an actual person yep. somewhat who was like an Irish beat cop. Cool nowhere near connected in terms of what actually ended up happening in this. Then there was the fictional version in the 50s that was, again, an Irish beat cop, but like a little more closely connected to the Untouchables. Then this happened, and it so completely changed the character that not only is it a stereotype and is, is obviously a touchstone, but when it came to the 1993 television series, they had John Rhys Davies take over the character. I had a hard time with with uh, with De Niro, and not because of him, but because of my character. And and I remember, I didn't. Ex I was a young actor. I didn't exactly know, you know, how to, how to deal with it. But I was a, I was a straight and narrow guy Elliot on is. that that sure. thing. And so my dialogue was really precise. And we got into this big scene where he kept going, "What, what?" And so what, what caused me to have to repeat. But it's like I couldn't get off the page with the with the kind of street language he could get. And 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 Connery goes, just listen to him, Mr. Nash, you'll know when to get in it. <laughs> and, 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 he, and he goes, yeah, don't try to compete. Don't try to compete, Mr. Ness. And he would uh, refer to you as Mr. Ness. Yeah, he would call me Mr. Nash. Mr. Nash. <laughs> and um but he he was helpful to me because because De Palma, it was right, you know, he, he's a gangster, he's going. And I I had to deal with him with the language that Mamet had. And I, I really learned a lot. It, it was One of the things that's listed in the IMDb is that the members of the Untouchables actually didn't suffer any fatalities. Yeah. and the Whereas on screen, two of them died. Yeah. yeah. And, and the and Untouchables, realistically, is entirely in Elliot Ness's head. I, well, it's Capone did specifically put out an order of nonviolence against the Untouchables. Like Crash said, specifically because Capone knew that that would bring down more trouble on him than he and his organization could handle. Yeah. And also, uh, with the bombing scene, there's the simple fact that if they had gone with the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, De Palma would lose an opportunity to lift from Alfred Hitchcock. Yes, and there's the other problem with this movie. It is reference the film. Every and shot it, in this is yeah. a reference to something. Oh, okay. So you all right, you have to watch like a, a couple of dozen films ranging from 1908 to I think the late 40s to understand all the references in this. But every interesting shot, every strange choice, every time you went, that was a weird scene. That's a reference. It's entirely taken from another movie. And Brian De Palma just goes, I enjoyed that. It's so like all of the close-ups, the the get the the trinket that Malone had, and the matchbook, and yeah, so all of those all things that seemed really out of place. But not only that. So uh, the conclusion, or not not the full conclusion, uh, the um, the climax at the train scene, uh, the train station, 
that was rather strange, yeah. wouldn't you say, for someone who who has uh, just watched it for the first time? Uh, oh, you mean that whole baby stroller thing, the pram yeah. going down the stairs, and oh, then yeah. and then Stone stopping it just at the right time, but still having a lead on? Yeah, that was all very odd. That comes from a Soviet propaganda film yep. from, I believe, nineteen. I think uh, it's twenty three. Twenty twenty three. Yeah, uh, called the Battleship Potemkin. Uh, and it's a very famous scene of a stroller rolling down a, uh, a stone steps and um, the white imperial uh, uh, soldiers marching behind it to go and kill uh, a, a mob of uh, revolutionaries. Now, see, they, they, the idea of the pram is used a lot in television and movies. I've seen it numerous times. Don't even yep. ask me what shows and movies it was. Um, yeah, and now you know just, why. I had just, there were so many issues I had with this movie. So many issues. And like my my literal like two minute search between IMDb and Wikipedia brought up so many issues that didn't mesh up. Like the whole wife's, wife's name and stuff. And just, I could not get into the movie. The fact that I was checking Wikipedia and IMDb during the movie shows you that I could not get into the movie. I don't understand how anybody won an award for any of this. It just, no. And I, I think it comes down to expectation. So now we expect films to be tighter, to have uh, uh, more specific character points, beats, um, uh, some themes coming up. This, however, came at a time when quite frankly this yeah no this accounted to what an oscar award-winning film was and it's yeah. messy and it's incomplete and it's sloppy uh very but much so that, that's what the standards were yeah it's very it's very much not about being accurate or being realistic it's dramatizing to the point of essentially creating a myth because like this is a heavily mythologized, heavily romanticized Chicago. Um, this is Gotham City. Yeah, but they're based basically, on, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> they didn't even have the caveat of this movie is based on real life characters or real life events. It didn't have that. So I really hope that anyone doing a bio for school on Ness does not use this towards their 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 their, their written work, because wow, this I this is that this is that I think that starting point where like 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 I said when we reviewed the original craft that oh okay I like this I want to go find out what actually happened. Uh, though that said, this uh, uh, also has a starting point as, as uh, in, in so far as like a certain kind of historical drama in Hollywood, uh, and you can have a direct line from this to Braveheart uh, in terms of uh, um, vaguely historical dramas that are not at all accurate. But it didn't matter because at the time audiences were more interested in what story you could tell than the butchering of history. Yeah. But even with Braveheart, I mean, that goes back to the 1200s. I think it was 1200s. But I mean, that's far okay. enough back in history that any written, any written report of those events is you're playing 20 million games of Postman because so-and-so says so-and-so, so-and-so, so. -and, -so, and, -so, -and, -so. and it, it just, from point A to Actually, point B, there are so many changes in there. This, the, the yeah. whole Ness and Capone thing happened in the 30s. It's a lot more recent. True, but there was uh, accurate uh, record keeping for yeah. Braveheart. Like, um, because it occurred at such a high level, uh, specifically uh, uh, within the political establishment of Scotland and England, there's detailed accounts and records. So we know how badly that was fucked up. <laughs> And with this, this is in in terms of historical documentation. This is entirely uh, from uh, Ness's perspective, because as much as Ness himself 
never saw any fame or recognition or financial gain or anything from taking down Capone. Like when, when he died, it wasn't even reported in the media. Nothing. He was broke. He was a broke drunk. No one. Cared. Oh yeah. But a- after he passed, uh, his book, uh, I think it was uh, the case files of the untouchables was then ad- adapted into the TV series starring Robert Stack. And it all literally spiraled from there. Yeah. So uh, there, there was a push at the time from within uh, uh, the office of uh, J. Edna to uh, um, uh, change the way, or not change, manipulate the way that uh, the American public thought about uh, federal officers, the FBI, and et cetera. And at some point, uh, someone in his office handed him a copy of Elliot Ness's book. And he essentially decided to base a complete, like an entire media campaign around this is what you should think of the federal enforcement officers as we're all Elliot Ness's as Elliot Ness tells it in that yeah. kind of manner of like, we're not just cops. We're super cops. We're super cops who stop super villains. And it affected the way that the public saw the FBI straight into uh, about the eighties. It was incredibly per- pervasive. And yeah, he didn't get to see any of it. No. Bob is the quintessential Al Capone. I mean, he's the greatest character actor of his generation. And, and um, he just doesn't have any peers. And so as far as I'm concerned, and it has been an ordeal. But uh, I really think that after this, there won't be a reason to ever do Al Capone. You know, I think Bobby is going to nail it. Uh, Robert De Niro prepared for Capone first by eating. He had to put on about 25 pounds, which is round with his face out. Then he went to Italy and worked with some people he'd worked with before in order to pull his hairline back. So he'd get that very round moon face that Capone had. And then he had to put on the two scars that Capone has on the side of his face. This makeup job took about three hours to do in the morning. And it was fabulous. De Niro is, of course, one of the greatest actors in America today. Uh, And he liked the material, and that was very flattering to us. He liked the mammoth language. He liked this new conception of Al Capone instead of making him kind of a street thug. He's sort of a, a man of words, a man that likes to talk to the press, a man that is very eloquent. Uh, and the press finds very colorful. So, uh, finally, uh, before we go into uh, ratings and such, uh, let's play a little alternate casting. Uh, Because, for instance, here's who we could have had for Al Capone. Everyone in Hollywood apparently was offered this role before Kevin fucking Costner. (laughs) Then why didn't any of them take it? We get in there. Uh, for but for uh, Capone, it could have been Marlon Brando, which is the single most obvious stereotypical casting choice in the history of film. Which is why you couldn't do it. Oh, Bra- they they could have Brando turned it down. No, no, no. That's why I'm like I'm saying. Uh, so so you're you they're trying to make a reference with that obvious casting to yeah. Godfather. Okay, fine. But you don't make a direct reference when you do that stuff. You don't have the Godfather come on to play a Godfather. You have De Niro, who played the younger version of the Godfather, come to play the Godfather. That's how you do a reference. And if if De Niro had said no, it would have been Bob Hoskins. Which would have been fantastic. Oh, yeah. As well. And it... In Hoskins' case, like it worked out particularly great from him, uh, because he basically ended up in the same scenario that Johnny Depp is in now with the Fantastic Beasts franchise, in that he got paid to be let go from the movie and do nothing. Yeah, and all he had to do for the next year was read scripts and hey, the hell's this weird thing, Roger Rabbit. <laughs> Uh, even uh, so far as I guess at one point Hoskins had contacted De Palma and was like, 
Listen, if you've got any more movie roles that you want me to not do. <laughs> I'll just be hanging over, uh, hanging out over here with Billy D. Williams, enjoying our getting paid for nothing money. <laughs> Uh, and of course, uh, now we come to Elliot Ness, uh, who, like uh, Crash mentioned, Kevin Costner was nowhere near the first choice. Um, like De Palma initially did not want him because in '87 Costner was not a very well known actor. Um. Now, this, is, this is before he hit big. This is yeah. his first big. Everything that is the Costner verse comes after this. Yeah. Now, initially, and uh, more or less on the recommendation of uh, Giorgio Armani, who had worked with him on Miami Vice, we could have had Don Johnson as Elliot yeah. Ness. Yeah very strongly wanted don johnson don yep. johnson was so close to getting this and possibly being immortalized as an actually capable actor instead of don johnson the alcoholic ness i can see don johnson the boy scout ness not so much ah but there is a third option that could have been uh it could have existed the hard ass very large and very wide gene hackman ness Hold that thought. I could see him hold as that Capone. Yes, that would hold be that thought. Hold, hold, we put a, put a pin in the Hackman thought. That's coming back. The uh, because uh, John like Johnson actually declined the part, and didn't didn't actually waited a few years before he told his good friend Kevin Costner that he had been up for the role. Now, also on the list, Mickey Rourke, who personally is a giant bag of no. At the time, I could see it. Any time after that, no. No. Uh, he apparently also declined. Uh, this one, I can kind of see it. Jeff Bridges. Yeah. Um, now this, someone here who really wanted this, but couldn't do it, Mel Gibson. As Ness? Yeah. Yep. He apparently wanted the Elliot Ness role and wanted it badly. So this is before, obviously, before him being pulled over by the cop or being drunk while driving. Oh, oh yeah. Decades before that. This is oh, actually yeah. before Lethal Weapon. As a matter of fact, he couldn't do it because he was contractually obligated to this tiny little independent film called Lethal Weapon. Uh, that was next... after Tim, wasn't it? Was it what? I'm pretty sure that was after Tim. Tim. Um, you haven't seen Tim? I don't know Tim. I got nothing. Um if you can find it um tim was uh, mel gibson early days were in he played a character who was socially and kind of mentally challenged who had a, a mrs robinson relationship oh that sounds very 80s and terrible yeah <laughs> Needless to say, I was a huge fan of Mel Gibson at one point in time for me to know that little bit of tidbit. Now, some, some of the rest of the list for uh, Elliot Ness, this, this is like some of these choices where it gets a little strange uh, because these actors probably would have worked better in other roles. And the, the names that I pulled aren't even quite as insane as the full list that you'll see on IMDb. Uh, because anytime you see a large list of actors that were considered for a role, the second half of that IMDb list will be downright weird. Uh, in this case, the list on IMDb contained 
Sylvester Stallone and Arnold Schwarzenegger for Ness. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, no, they shouldn't be anywhere near this. <laughs> uh, but we also have uh, Jack Nicholson. Now I can see how it was a Capone. I can't yeah, see it was Ness. Yeah. There's no way that he would be a Ness. He's especially if you're looking at um, his version of of um, the, the Batman character. I, th- there's no way that him as the Joker would translate to Ness. Nor would. And I think that's to- about the, tape, okay. the same time frame. Yeah. Uh, well, kind of. Yeah. Um, I can't see him translating that to Capone either, though, because Capone's too too volatile but not like crazy uh batman was two he, years later no i can see yeah. him doing capone i can easily see him doing capone at that time yeah Nick nicholson i would have said capone maybe frank nitty yes oh frank, definitely but, nitty yeah, he yeah, would have had yeah. fun with nitty yeah oh yeah you have to but, allow him to, to be crazy and capone didn't need to be crazy capone needed to be composed and that's why you need robert de niro because he yeah. has a fury under a composure that's just barely holding on jack nicholson has insanity under a composure he wears just because it's convenient yeah and like really no matter what if you were to put nicholson in this movie he has to be somewhere in the capone family like the closest that i could see him as as an untouchable is maybe malone and even that to me is kind of stretching it. I think yeah. if you, you if, know who would have made a good Capone? Hmm. Tommy Lee Jones. That was would have made a good funny Capone. story. Yeah. Funny story. Was he offered it? Because he would have made a good Capone. I'll give Ness. you three guesses who my next name on the list for Elliot Ness was. Yeah. For Ness? No, yes. I could see him as a Capone. No, no, no. He plays cops. Tommy Lee Jones plays cops. That's what he is very good at. Yeah, but he plays hard ass cops. Yeah. And I think T- Tommy Lee Jones as Elliot Ness would have been the same as Kevin Costner's performance, but better simply because Tommy Lee Jones is better than Kevin Costner. <laughs> like, oh, leaps and bounds. I, like, like, like I said in the intro, this is Kevin Costner playing. Ca- uh, like Captain America in, in some, and Tommy Lee Jones would have been Tommy Lee Jones playing Tommy Lee Jones pretending to be Elliot Ness. Yeah. Like, I mean, it would, it would have worked, but y- you know what you're getting. Finally, of course, uh, ratings. Um, for me, honestly, uh, this is a four out of five. I've, I've always had an absolute blast with this movie. It's it's so quotable. It's like as someone who loves a uh, film noir, uh, who loves watching essentially a a myth being told, and especially discovering last night that God damn, this movie looks good in black and white. <laughs> Uh, I've had an absolute wonderful time with this, and like just the simple fact that I have been quoting Connery for years. Uh, Vita, what about you? Do you want to answer? <laughs> yeah, go for it. I would probably give it a two. I had a very difficult time getting into the movie. I had to fight the urge to pick up my phone and scroll Facebook. It was slow. It was beige. It was mundane. It was not what I expected, considering that, you know, there is a a, a history or um, a certain expectation that is attached to Ness and Capone. And this didn't reach my expectations at all like i mean nitty was the yeah. high point of my movie that was nitty was the high point i first saw him in charmed as bar i think it was barbus and just it it he was the high point of my experience with this movie 
Oh, and that oh. whole Sean Connery dying scene. I mean, did he shot him how many times? There were how many bullet holes in his torso? I'm sure one of them struck a, a, a vital organ at some point in time, and he still had enough time to crawl across his apartment, go into the music room or the sitting room or whatever, and still be alive when Ness showed up. We are talking the height of unbelievability. Oh, he, he, he's a tough old cop who performed his duty one last time. There's a there's tough cold cop, and then there's like you know Hollywood. There's just no, no. And if no. nothing else, if, if 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 nothing else, he did fulfill the first rule of law enforcement. Yes, at the end of the day, go home alive. He was already home. Yep, I just, he was off you know. shift. He was home, <laughs> and. uh second off the uh, crash movie you're rating <laughs> i give this movie two godfather threes <laughs> yeah it's not as bad as one godfather three it does a little better than a than than you know one and a half godfather threes it's a solid two godfather threes you tried you failed but you were succeed uh, successful and people liked you in the end Unlike Godfather. To the point where they gave it an award. Jesus Christ. Uh, well, if nothing else, Sean Connery was there to work. And that's all he sort was of. there for. Uh, I guess, <laughs> uh, there's one story that I didn't pull from my notes, but let me see if I can... Oh, yeah. Uh, Sir Sean Connery turned up to the shoot in his golf clothes. They did a close open, and Sean was dismissed for the day. He came back after a full day of golf, acted for five minutes, then went to go home. Andy Garcia and Charles Martin Smith grabbed him after the scene and said, That was very clever of you. You just got back from golf. Turn up for five minutes and do your scene, and that's it. Connery turned to them and said, This is not my first barbecue. The man's kind of a golf addict. Professionalism. Yeah. Well, I mean, he is Scottish. Just... Oh, very, very true. <laughs> uh, As a Scots, I promise never to play golf. Just... <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, with that, so... um. As I said earlier, this is going to be at least technically our final episode for the year. Um, at the very least, it's the final one that I know for sure that we're doing. Uh, we may or may not do something with a Christmas movie. Uh, it's going to uh, depend on everybody's schedules. Um, I'm tempted to say, can we do every version of Black Christmas? Okay. And I don't like Margot Kidder. I do not like Margot Kidder. But there's like, what, three versions of Black Christmas now? Oh, at least. <laughs> uh, and, and I feel like just from Crash's initial reaction, we might have to make that a possibility. <laughs> uh, but, uh... <laughs> uh, oh, we should do this whole drunk thing more often. Oh my god. <laughs> Uh, otherwise, uh, I do have, uh, several, uh, lost reviews that I stumbled across on one of my hard drives that were recorded in, I think, 2018, give or take. So, uh, I'll be releasing those as B-rolls, so there are, there's going to be content of some sort. Otherwise, don't ask me what our next movie is, because I haven't got a goddamn clue. Uh, but, uh, if anyone to... asks me to watch Star Wars Christmas, I'm gonna have an issue. Just no. Why are you giving me ideas? <laughs> it's pretty bad, but even Mark Hamill says this is the worst thing I've been see I I've seen or been involved with, and I was part of Black of Star Wars Christmas. 
Oh, the the, the holiday special it is leg- was legitimately what Carrie Fisher used to get people out of her house. <laughs> Uh, but uh, with that, uh, Vita, what do you have going on in the meanwhile? Oh, good lords. Uh, yesterday I was at the Crafty Fox pop-up show. So it was my first in-person event since February because COVID. Uh, I'm assuming you're going to have this done in time for for production and release. Um, I will be at Christmas at the Forum. And they're changing things because of their, you know, the COVID restrictions. So instead of the final weekend of November, or actually it would have been the first week, the first weekend of November is what they usually book. Uh, they actually have seven weeks booked between the first weekend of November and, you know, seven weeks later. So they have seven three-day events at the forum. They've reduced things so that instead of cramming all the vendors in that they can, they have limited the vendors to a hundred at a time each weekend, and they are selling tickets online for 200 people at a time for an hour and a half to go through. We're all in one room as opposed to taking up the whole forum. And I am there for the last weekend of November and the first weekend of December. I will be there with my usual chain mail, wire wrap, my resin jewelry, and surprise, masks. <laughs> All the masks, I actually cut 38 of them in the 45 minutes before I went to go watch The Untouchables. So uh, the next two weeks for me is a bunch of show prep, getting ready for Christmas at the Forum. And yeah, I'll be there for two weeks. Uh, And of course, uh, Crash, what about you? I'm producing podcasts and videos. Check them out at patreon.com slash here we go. Nothing special, nothing timely. Just my old shit. <laughs> uh, so uh, with that, really, there's uh, only one way to properly sign off this episode. Uh, so until whatever the hell we discuss next. <laughs>